So last time we were looking at the period of the judges and the story was uh, at best ambiguous and at worst uh, declining. Uh, the stories of the judges seem to be organized uh, in uh, a declining order of uh, excellence on the part of the judges. And at the very end of the book, we have the note that um, there was at that time no king in Israel, and everyone, all the people, did what they pleased. The tendency in scholarship for a very long time, uh, probably uh, from the anti-monarchical forces in this country particularly, tended to read that as a positive note that uh, we were better off without a king and therefore they sort of retrojected that idea back into the Israelites. When you see the context in which that is uh, set though, uh, it is somewhat ambiguous and it's capable of being read in at least three different ways. One is to read it uh, positively as the way things ought to have been, uh, and that would be an anti-monarchical reading. And then there is a pro-monarchical reading, which you can get from uh, uh, just taking it in the opposite way. Uh, this makes better sense of the organization of the book of uh, Judges, <laughs> and also makes more sense of the uh, what to make of the horrific story that ends the book, which is a sign that the uh, tribes are not capable of governing themselves in cases of crimes that cut across tribal boundaries. And this is typical of the way these lineage system, judicial systems operate. Uh, it takes a uh, centralized force of some sort to get the uh, tribes to act together as a single unit. That's the challenge of a system like that. And the monarchical system solves that problem by lining up everything top to bottom. And so everybody is in some way subservient to the people or the king or the individual at the top. Uh, there's also a theological reading which some people prefer in which case king is capitalized and refers specifically to the deity. There was no king in Israel and therefore, uh, now that makes no particular sense given the way that Deuteronomy is emphasizing the important role of the deity in this material. So uh, I think you can probably set that one aside it's not that God has been absent. God has been in Judges all too present in the uh, events that are taking place. But that's where we are now uh, after that. And what we're going to get now is a thoroughly edited Deuteronomic version of the rise of kingship in Israel. Uh, the, uh, not only are the narratives about the rise of kingship themselves uh, organized in a Deuteronomic frame, and I have put that on the board for you. The Deuteronomic frame explicitly begins in 8, uh, 1 through 22. There's a long uh, bit of material there. Everything with an asterisk by it is a Deuteronomic frame. And so you can see that the material in the middle, 9, 1 through 10, 16, and 11, 1 through 15, which are two different stories about Saul's rise to power. Both of those uh, stories are now framed by the Deuteronomic uh, opinion about kingship. And you can see very uh, clearly that it's a pretty thoroughly edited text. And so what we're going to take away from it is the Deuteronomist's version of kingship, which uh, is, as you know from reading the book of Deuteronomy, negative. So uh, that comes as no great surprise. What a lot of people miss 
uh, in looking at this material, though, is the way that the Deuteronomistic historian has preceded the stories of the rise of kingship by the material in uh, chapters one through seven. And in those are three blocks of material. Uh, the first one being a story of the rise of the prophet Samuel, who will appear in these narratives both as a prophet, as a priest, and also as the last of the judges. And the uh, language used of him and the portrayal of his activities clearly indicates that we are to understand him as the last of the judges and one who is quite different from the other judges that we have looked at in the book of Judges. Uh, that is followed in turn uh, in 4, 7 through 2 by a long section of ark stories uh, which deal with the moving of the ark in various places, uh, the capture of the ark by the Philistines, and uh, what happens when the Philistines can't deal with the ark. And then uh, 7, 3 through 17 uh, takes us back to the story of Samuel and gives a picture which is quite positive of his own actions as a judge in Israel. Um, so uh, this whole section has been called the uh, aggrandizement of Solomon, I'm sorry, of uh, Samuel, um, because it seems to leave us with the impression that things were doing just fine uh, under the older system of the judges and that therefore the uh, rise of a monarchy was totally unnecessary in the context. Uh, the stories themselves, we're not gonna spend much time on the Samuel stories. They really belong with the uh, prophetic material that you'll look at in the second semester. This is the first large collection of prophetic uh, stories that we have, and they all focus on uh, Samuel. But notice the characteristic of them. The stories are in their present form woven into another set of stories that have to do with the shrine at Shiloh. And the shrine at Shiloh seems to be the place which the Lord has chosen to put the divine name at least temporarily. Now, that uh, idiom is never used in Samuel, which suggests that the stories themselves are probably older than the Deuteronomic version of them. And the um, stories are geared at explaining why the priesthood at Shiloh was at the end of the day rejected. Now, this is a... Um, an interesting set of stories because a lot of scholars think that the Deuteronomists themselves are from the priesthood that used to preside at Shiloh. And so this is all negative material as far as the Deuteronomists are concerned. This will be a major embarrassment to the Deuteronomists and the stories about the aggrandizement of Samuel and the rejection of the Shiloh priesthood will go together and it will be the uh, Samuel line and the line of the Levites that is uh, associated with the Ark that ultimately will uh, be rejected in favor of what the text calls a faithful priest and we will look at that. That's a word play on the word Zadok. And Zadok, of course, is one of David's priests, and it will be the Zadokite high priestly line that finally controls the priesthood in the late uh, pre-exilic and particularly in the post-exilic period. So we'll see here uh, a couple of things going on. These are all fights uh, within the priesthood. These are not things that you need to worry terribly much about. Uh, but I will at least point them out to you. Notice that at the beginning of the Samuel story, the aggrandizement of Samuel, we do have some characteristic Deuteronomistic themes. The first thing that you will see is a very close parallel to the uh, Samson story at the beginning of the Samson story, which is that Deuteronomic introduction. 
uh, which talks about the barren woman who has a child and so on. And here we have uh, a classic version of that same story. Now we've, we've run into a lot of these. We saw them with the ancestral stories. Uh, we saw them with the Samson story and now here they are again with the uh, story of the birth of Samuel. Uh, but notice that this one takes a decidedly priestly bent in two ways. Samuel will be finally the child born to the childless woman. And because God listened to her prayer that she made at the sanctuary at Shiloh, uh, the child will be dedicated to the sanctuary. And it's clear that that's the way that Deuteronomy understands the law of the firstborn that the firstborn goes to Yahweh, and Deuteronomy understands that as meaning that the uh, person becomes a priest and will be given to the sanctuary, uh, to serve the sanctuary. But notice that this is immediately uh, mixed into the theme of the inefficiency of the priesthood at Shiloh and the ultimate rejection of Shiloh as the place where the divine name will dwell. That is uh, symbolized in the story by the presence of the ark. Where the ark is, is by definition the place where the divine name dwells. Once the ark leaves, then the divine name is no longer there. And once that happens, then the sanctuary itself can be destroyed. You need to keep that in mind because the same set of ideas will be circulating around the ideas of the uh, uh, dis uh, destruction of Jerusalem later on where at least some uh, texts like Ezekiel portray the same thing as happening. The sanctuary got so uh, evil that the deity could not live there any longer and so rejected the sanctuary. Once that happens, the sanctuary is defenseless. We'll come back to that theme a bit later on. But notice the way in which the characters are portrayed here. Uh, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, very much disturbed by the fact that she cannot have a child. She has a co-wife to deal with. This sounds very much like the Jacob stories with the different wives and the harem intrigues that seem to go on uh, between the two of them. You get a very sensitive portrayal of Hannah here. She goes every year to the shrine with her husband uh, and uh, she finally makes a vow when she's praying to Yahweh and agrees to give the child to the sanctuary if the child is born. Notice though the portrayal of Eli, the high priest at Shiloh, which uh, now is uh, going to enter this story of Samuel and the birth of Samuel. Uh, Eli clearly at one time, as the narrative portrays him, was a faithful priest of Yahweh at Shiloh, but that was a very long time ago, and he has gotten old now. His sons have taken over the running of the sanctuary, and he is no longer able to control his sons. And so the priestly line is deteriorating at Shiloh, and they are engaging in all sorts of illegitimate practices which they should not be doing. But notice this. Um, after uh, the woman is praying, Eli observed her mouth. This is uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Observed her mouth, and Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Now, what kind of a priest <laughs> would do this? Is somebody actually praying in the sanctuary, which doesn't seem to me to be an unusual thing to be doing, uh, and immediately reaches the wrong conclusions? Uh, obviously, uh, Eli has not had any kind of pastoral care training <laughs> and doesn't really understand how to reach out to people who are obviously in need. Uh, she protests his claim, no, my lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have to tell you that. I have <laughs> drunk neither wine nor strong drink, 
but I have been pouring out my soul before Yahweh. Do not regard your servant as a baseless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation at this time. Uh, and Eli finally gets it and says, oh, yeah, all right. Uh, go in peace, the God of Israel, grant the petition that you have made, and so on. And so the child is eventually born, and uh, the, uh, um, she makes good on the vow and brings the child to the sanctuary. Um, this is followed by several other uh, themes. In uh, chapter 2, we have another story of the, after the prayer of Hannah, which is another one of these old uh, pieces of poetry that uh, inhabits these stories from time to time. It's of the same genre uh, as the uh, 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 Judges 5 prayer, for example, or the Crossing of the Sea prayer in Exodus 15. All of this material is usually thought to be relatively old poetry. Uh, and here it is embedded in the story of Hannah. It's Hannah's song. Um, so, uh, but immediately after it, it's followed by the uh, story of the misbehavior of Eli's sons, this is 2.12. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels. Uh, the uh, narrator has no use at all for this priesthood that is developing at Shiloh. They had no regard for Yahweh or for the duties of the priests of the people. When anyone offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come, and while the meat was boiling, this is meat that is going to be offered eventually to the deity, and certain cuts of it are offered to the deity, certain cuts are the property of the priest. They would come with a three-pronged fork and plunge it into the boiling pot and take whatever they wanted out of the pot. This is Yahweh's sacrifice. Yahweh is not happy with the way in which the priests are doing this. Uh, the, uh, in the meantime, the uh, young child is growing up and is becoming a priest in the sanctuary at Shiloh, a kind of apprentice priest in training in the sanctuary. And uh, in the meantime, God has had enough of the priesthood at Shiloh. And in verse 27 of chapter 2, and an unnamed man of God, a prophetic figure of some sort, came to Eli and said, Thus said the Lord, I revealed myself to the family of your ancestor in Egypt when they were slaves to the house of Pharaoh. I chose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar and to offer incense, to wear the ephod before me, and I gave to the family of your ancestor all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then look with a greedy eye at my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded and honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? God is really unhappy with the way that the shrine at Shiloh is operating. Uh, <clears throat> so Yahweh declares, far be it for me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me will be treated with contempt. The time is coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your ancestors' family, so that no one in your family will live to old age. Then in distress you will look with a greedy eye on all of the property that, should be, that shall be bestowed upon Israel, and no one in your family will ever, ever live to an old age. The old, only one of you uh, I shall not cut off from my altar will be spared to weep out his eyes. There's no, no real clear idea who this is going to be, but this is going to be the fate of the priesthood uh, finally at uh, Shiloh. Uh, and uh, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. This is the word play on the word site and Sadok, Zadok, uh, a faithful priest. So it is the story of the elevation of the Zadok priesthood that is here embedded in the middle of uh, stories about the Aaronids. So we're not worried here about the Aaronids, the Levites, and the Zedekites. 
uh, but those are the three major groupings of the priesthood. This is followed in our narrative by the very famous story of the call of Samuel, which mostly not only dramatizes the role that Samuel is to have in the uh, uh, later uh, rise of the monarchy, but is also uh, going to show you more examples of Eli's inability to function any longer as the high priest at Shiloh. Uh, it's a famous story, and it's uh, interestingly told. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord. This is chapter 3. Uh, under Eli, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. You can see why. And when it does come, it's not a good word. People don't want to hear what God has to say about the shrine at Shiloh. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of Yahweh where the ark was. So that's the arrangement of people uh, in the story. Uh, and uh, Samuel is, for some reason, sleeping in the same room with the ark. Now, this seems to be a no-brainer when it, the ark begins to talk uh, a bit later on. Uh, and so um, Yahweh called Samuel, Samuel, and he woke, wakes the kid up. And he, Samuel says, here am I, and ran to Eli. He said, here I am, for you called me. This kid has no idea what's going on. You'd think you would figure it out, right? He's sleeping in the room with the ark and he hears voices. Ought to be some connection there, but uh, Samuel doesn't get it. And more importantly, neither does Eli. And so Eli uh, responds when Samuel comes out and says, you called me? He said, no, I didn't call you, lie down again. Uh, Eli has no idea what's going on. Uh, now, Samuel did not uh, yet know Yahweh, which is the narrative explanation for why Samuel didn't figure this out. And, but Eli should have figured it out. Uh, <clears throat> the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to Samuel. And so Yahweh called Samuel again a third time now. We've gone through this twice. He calls a third time. And he went up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And Eli finally figured, oh, wait a minute, didn't stuff like this used to happen? A long time ago, I have a vague memory of this. So after three times, Eli finally gets it and gives him what is probably a kind of liturgical response. That is, what do you do when you hear Yahweh calling? Uh, well, you respond in a particular way. And Eli then tells Samuel, the next time this happens, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And that works. So the next time it happens, uh, Samuel responds with the correct uh, response. And what he hears is an unpleasant offering uh, from the deity. See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both the ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On the day that I fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, for I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the, inquiry, <coughs> or for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. So yet another, this is exactly the same message, but different words, that the unnamed prophet has already delivered to Samuel, uh, 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 to Eli. And uh, here it is again being delivered directly. And the agent of doing this is the prophet Samuel. Uh, so he passes the bad word along to Samuel, and the story ends with these words, which are significant in the context 
uh, as a Deuteronomic sign of the special character of Samuel. Samuel grew up and Yahweh was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. That is, everything that he said happened. This is, of course, something that you have already read in the uh, Deuteronomy chapter on the prophet. The prophet who is like Moses is one whose word always happens. And so the Deuteronomist is saying, here is a character now in the narrative who is another one of those prophets like Moses. And from now on, you will know that everything that this one says is going to be true. So the, the Deuteronomistic writer here is signaling the special character of Samuel uh, as the uh, narrative uh, proceeds. Uh, and the people recognize this too because now God speaks again at Shiloh because the Lord has revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So uh, it's after this that we begin the ark stories. We, the ark stories are sort of humorous uh, if you're not a Philistine. Um, <laughs> And it's clear that uh, the ark is not going to stay in Shiloh, but on the other hand, it doesn't like the idea of living with the Philistines either. And so uh, it keeps doing things to the Philistines, and the Philistines finally decide uh, they've had enough of this and they can't handle it. So they very carefully send it back to the Israelites. The Israelites, in turn, uh, cannot handle it until they get a Levite, who is the traditional handler of the ark. And it winds up being put in the house of the Levite, where it stays until David will rescue it from uh, that location and bring it back to Jerusalem and install it in the new shrine that he wants to build in Jerusalem. All right, so... Um, that's the, the way that the ark stories now uh, work. Uh, this is followed in uh, uh, the uh, narrative by a period of peace that seems to exist while Samuel is serving as a judge. And this is uh, important to notice the stories about the rise of kingship, uh, you get the narrative in chapter 7 around verse 3. Uh, Samuel does a good Deuteronomic thing by calling all of the people to uh, return to Yahweh. Uh, Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtartes. This is a typical Deuteronomic sermon. We heard this from Joshua. We've heard this from Moses. And now we're hearing it from Samuel, who is serving as the uh, judge in this particular period. The point of going on about this is that uh, asking for a king is something that really does not need to be done according to the perspective of the Deuteronomistic historians. But it does lead us in the narrative to the uh, different stories of the rise of Saul. There are at least three of these stories, per, uh, and some scholars see even more than that uh, lying behind it. Uh, the one story uh, which is the closest, I think, to historical reality is 11, 1 through 15. That is, it's the story which fits well with the comments we have made about the social structure of Israel in this period, what lineage governance looks like, and so on. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, if, if you look at what goes on here, it fits pretty well with the uh, notion of a temporary chief who is finally pushed beyond that by the people and who becomes a uh, king over Israel. Um, <clears throat> so in 11, uh, we get 
the story. Uh, about a month later, Nakash the Ammonite, they have been in a fight with the Ammonites, uh, besieged Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to Nakash, make a treaty with us and we will serve you. But Nakash the Ammonite said to them, on this condition I will make a treaty with you, namely that I gouge out everyone's right eye and thus put disgrace on all of Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, give us seven days a respite and then we will send us uh, so that we may send messengers throughout the territory of Israel. Then if no one is there to save us, we will give ourselves to you. This is a typical problem of a lineage. If you're going to fight against the Ammonites, you'd need more forces than a single tribe can muster. And so you've got to get help. And so they go around to see who is willing to help them. You have to try to get all of the tribes, or at least more than one, to uh, work with you in this problem. And so when the messengers uh, came to Gibeah of Saul, uh, they reported the matter to in the hearing of the people, and all the people wept aloud. Notice they don't do anything. They're just really sorry about this. Uh, but that's the way things seem to go. Uh, but Saul has a different idea. Saul is coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, what's the matter with the people? Uh, that they're all weeping, and they told him the message from the inhabitants of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul in power. Notice this, this image that it accompanies the judges. That's an idiom from the stories about the judges. So it's clear that Saul is about to uh, get an infusion of divine support for his leadership. Uh, so it came upon Saul in power when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took the yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all of the territory of Israel by his messengers, saying, Whoever does not come after Saul and Samuel, so shall be done to his oxen. And more than that, probably, is the threat. Uh, it's not just the oxen who are in danger. If you don't help us out, uh, you may find yourself in the same position as the oxen. So it's under this kind of military threat that Saul becomes first a war chief in Israel, and then eventually the people come and anoint him king because of this military activity. And this is, this is a kind of classic scenario uh, for how a lineage-based society moves into the position of being a monarchy. So that is one story of Saul's uh, efforts. Uh, he begins as a judge and winds up as a king because of the people's activity and their appreciation for what he did in this difficult situation. Uh, there is, however, a version of the story here which is much more uh, detailed and fuller, and it reads very much like something that may well have been generated by Saul's own uh, campaign personnel. Uh, if Saul were campaigning for the idea of king, uh, a story like this seems to be designed to first of all exhibit all of the characteristics of kingship that the Deuteronomistic historians might be thought to accept. If there are any lurking Deuteronomists out there in the audience, it's just that kind of story which might put them at ease over the idea about Saul being king. Uh, if you're gonna have a king, then you better have one like Saul, according to this particular version of the story. It appears now in chapter 9, so it's the first voice you hear after the idea that Israel has now asked for a king. We'll come back to that. That's the framing story of the Deuteronomist in chapter 8 that precedes this narrative. But in 9, we get a very interesting story about Saul. Uh, he was a man of Benjamin. 
uh, who's, uh, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Aviel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorah, son of Apia, uh, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. That's more than they ever tell us about an ancestor. Uh, more generations. So the point is very clear. Saul is descended from an old Benjaminite family. Uh, he has a lot of his own money. Uh, he is wealthy. His father was wealthy. Uh, and so he has inherited wealth. Uh, the tribe of Benjamin is a good choice if you're going to have a king because it is one of the smallest and weakest of the northern tribes. It sits right next door to Ephraim, which is the largest and most powerful of the northern tribes. And so if you're going to have a king, better have one from one of the weaker tribes that might be manipulated more easily than you get with uh, a larger tribe. So we are told a great deal about Saul's background in the way that he's described here. Yeah. Do you mean manipulated more easily like by the Deuteronomists or? Well, by the Ephraimites probably. And maybe later on by the Judahites, who are the other big tribe, but that one in the south. So uh, politically, you want somebody who is more amenable. Get somebody from Rhode Island. You don't want somebody from New York. <laughs> Would be the uh, equivalent uh, in the modern period. Um, notice that uh, he has a son. This, this uh, Kish has a son whose name was Saul. Handsome young man, looks good in the publicity photos. Um, just sort of looks like he ought to be a king. Um, there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. He was head and shoulders above everyone else. So a uh, big, tall, handsome movie star looking kind of guy apparently. Uh, now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, had strayed. So Kish said to his son, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he went through the land of the country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, or a third land, however you want to do, one translates that. But he did not find them, and they passed through the land of Shalim. But they were not there either. And when he passed through the land of Benjamin... They didn't find them. That's where they started, presumably. Uh, when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to the boy who was with him, it's probably time for us to turn back. We have no idea where these places are, incidentally. But Zuf apparently is about as far away from home as he wants to go. And he says, good son that he is, um, perhaps my father will quit worrying about the donkeys and start worrying about us. <laughs> I mean, nice kid, uh, concerned about his father. Um, but his uh, servant said to him, notice this idea does not come from Saul, it comes from the servant. Servant says for him, well, there is a man of God in the town, and he is held in honor. Whatever he says always comes true. We know who this is going to be, right? This is a much diminished portrait of Samuel and his importance for the rise of kingship. Um, so it's just sort of peripheral as this story is told. Uh, it, the candidate is really the major figure here in the story. Uh, let us go there now. Maybe he will tell us something about the journey on which we have set out. And Saul then replied to the boy, but if we go, what can we bring him? The bread in our sacks is gone. They've been on the road a long time. There is no present to bring the man of God. People like this expect to be paid for their services. Uh, notice that this idea, again, is not going to be, or the money is not going to come from Saul. It's going to be the servant who now says, well, I have a quarter shekel of silver. I can give that to the man of God. So it's the servant who is giving the money for this. It's not Saul himself who is paying for the oracle. Uh, formerly in Israel, those who went to inquire of God would say, let us go to the seer. 
uh, for the one who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. That's important for understanding prophecy. It's irrelevant to the story, uh, except it does use an old term, which is not used elsewhere, and probably suggests that this is an old story uh, that is now embedded in the Deuteronomistic uh, story. It is not uh, using Deuteronomistic terminology to describe this kind of transaction. So it probably is an old story that may well have attached to Saul as part of his campaign uh, literature. Uh, so as they went up to the hill, the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? And they said, yes, he's here. Uh, hurry, he has just now come to the town because the people have a sacrifice today at the shrine. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him for he, uh, before he goes up to the, eat. For the people will not eat until he comes and blesses the sacrifice. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. And so they went up. Now, the day before Saul came, Yahweh had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be a ruler, he does not use the word king, over my people Israel. So what Saul is going to be uh, eventually uh, anointed as is not a melech, a king, but an, a ruler. There is a difference in terminology here that they seem to be insisting on. And uh, it's an indication that in these early stories about kingship, uh, they will be uh, anointed as a ruler, a nagid, and not a melech, a full-blown king. They seem to be avoiding the term king. The same thing will happen incidentally to David, who will also be anointed by Samuel as a Nagid, not as a Melech. So uh, the people, however, in the story we just looked at, uh, uh, chose Saul to be a Melech, a king. But it was the people who pushed for that, not Saul himself. Uh, there's a lot of political use of language going on in these stories. So Saul uh, approached uh, Samuel inside the gate and said, uh, you know, where's the house of the seer? Uh, Samuel said, I'm the seer. Uh, go up before me to the shrine. Today you will eat with me, and in the morning I will tell you what you need to know. Uh, as for your donkeys uh, that were lost three days ago, don't worry about them any longer. They've been found. And so the story, it looks like it's about to uh, wind up. And on uh, whom is all Israel's desire fixed, if not on you, and your ancestral house. Uh, Saul uh, deflects the compliment. I am only a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel, and my family is the humblest of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, what more could you want in a king? Somebody who, if elected, will not serve, and who is uh, really not seeing himself as a major figure in the political future of Israel. Then uh, Samuel took Saul and his servant boy and brought them to the hall, and he gave him a, head, a place at the head of the table uh, and so on, and gives him a special portion of the uh, sacrifice. Uh, and so as they were going down from the feast at the outskirts of the town, this is verse 27, Samuel said to Saul, tell the boy to go on before us, and when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of Yahweh. Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Yahweh has anointed you a king over Israel, a ruler over Israel. Uh, notice that the, uh, this fits the Deuteronomic pattern. The uh, choice of the king is at the discretion of the deity. It's the person is native born. The person comes from a wealthy family, but does not buy kingship, uh, and so on. So he's fitting uh, the, exactly what the Deuteronomist would want in a king. Now you'd think that this would probably work. Uh, there are divine signs that come upon Saul after this anointing that indicate that God has really chosen him to be the ruler of Israel. Uh, Saul himself does not seem to have engineered it, 
And when the story is over, he goes back to taking care of his father's donkeys and his oxen. So there is no indication that this has an immediate impact on anything that is about to happen. Uh, later on, there will be a public choice of the new king by lot, which is another way of displaying that this is all divine choice that is making Saul the king in Israel. This is now framed by the Deuteronomistic historian's comments. And they begin in chapter 8 with the uh, comment that all of the elders came to Samuel at Ramah and said, you are old and your sons do not follow in your way. Now this was an appropriate thing to say to Eli, whether it's a thing to say to Samuel is another matter. But the same accusation is being made. Uh, give us therefore a king to govern us like other nations. This is straight out of the law of the king in Deuteronomy. It's, it's a quotation from the law of the king. Uh, so uh, when they say this, uh, Deuteronomy says, you may indeed choose a king, one who is from among your own people, and then you get the list of the, the qualifications of the king. Uh, so here, though, Samuel is incensed at the idea of asking for a king. He has been doing quite well, thank you, uh, governing Israel as one of the last of the judges and doesn't see any particular reason. He takes it personally that the people are asking for a king and that they don't think he's doing a very good job. God uh, responds, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say, they have not, not rejected you, they have rejected me from being king over them. So God also takes it personally and this is going to turn out to be a very negative reading of kingship. Uh, Samuel reports God's words to the people and he says these, uh, the people were asking for a king and he said, well, all right, but these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground, and some to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves, the best of your cattle, uh, your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but Yahweh will not answer you in that day. Uh, fair enough to say that this is a negative view of kingship, and it is against that that we get Saul's own propaganda about what a wonderful king he might make. Uh, if you are convinced by that, in 10, 17 through 27, you get another negative interpretation of kingship. And finally, uh, after the story of the Ammonites, you get the final one in chapter 12, where the people now realize the error that they have made. And they come to Samuel and say, isn't there anything we can do about this? And he says, essentially, no, all this toothpaste is out of the tube. There's no way to get it back in again. Uh, you've done it, and uh, you're going to have to live with it. But he gives a, f a farewell speech. Samuel said to all Israel, I have to listen to you in everything you said to me and have set a king over you. See, it is the king who leads you now. I am old and gray, but my sons are with you. I have led you from my youth until this day. Here I am, testify against me before Yahweh and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? You get this long negative confession of the things that uh, Samuel has not done. He's saying, you know, see if you can make any kind of accusation against me at all. 
Uh, he, of course, has not done anything, and the people are witnesses to that. Uh, Samuel then said to the people, Yahweh is a witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of the land of Egypt. This is pure Deuteronomy speak. Now, therefore, take your stand that I may enter into judgment with you before Yahweh and declare to you all the saving deeds of Yahweh that he has performed for you and your ancestors. And so we get a, a replay of a kind of Deuteronomic sermon about what all the people have done. Uh, and where they are up to this time. All the people now realize what a dreadful mistake they have made in, and made in verse 19. They say to him, pray to Yahweh for your servants that we may not die, for we have added to all of our sins the evil of demanding a king for ourselves. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following Yahweh, but serve Yahweh with all your heart, and do not turn aside after useless things, and so on. The Lord will not cast away his people for his great name's sake, because he has pleased, it has pleased Yahweh uh, to make you a people for himself. As for me, uh, far be it for me that I should sin against Yahweh by ceasing to pray for you. This is one of the classic things that the Mosaic prophet does, is to pray on behalf of the people and to transmit the wishes of the people to the deity. And we'll see that playing out uh, later on in the narrative. This is now the introduction to Saul's reign as the narrative stands. So next time we're going to uh, look at the uh, reign of Saul, which will not take long, and then we're going to talk about the rise of David, which will take considerably longer. <clears throat>